back to screen share. Sorry about that. I realize that the other students who are not here might want to see this. I'm just kidding. I know they don't want to see this. Okay. So back in a state of nature, um, you have all this freedom, but on the other hand, you have no protection. So it, it comes back to that sort of ultimate trade-off that we read about with like Hobbes and Locke and all those people who were talking about this, this, this trade that you had to make to live in society. So they had sort of abandoned that trade. They were just loose and free and kind of do whatever they wanted. Do whatever you want. It was great. Kind of great, except for crime. So, we also end up um, in a lot of ways with these social changes about luxury. And this is what we talked about a little bit last week. So the people in the country are doing whatever they want, like kind of free will, do whatever you will. Uh, the people in the towns are getting more and more sophisticated and they're becoming more and more like obsessed with their sophistication. So there becomes this sort of second layer of the economy. So basically people wanted to have luxurious items, but to do that, they had to sort of work extra hard. So previously, people had worked as hard as they needed to to survive. Now they're doing a little bit of extra work so they can get luxury things. So sort of like putting in overtime, perhaps. So, oops, sorry. Um, so basically, people are getting these luxury items and they're displaying these luxury items. We're back to sort of that like tea set analogy. Like last week, I think a lot of y'all mentioned um, having logos on your shirt and that sort of thing. So basically surplus became very desirable. And the fact that surplus was desirable is gonna become one of the things that again, shapes the economy. So people are into surplus, but also uh, people are into looking at each other's surplus. So it wasn't enough, you know, that you had something, you were also sort of like watching what other people had, and it was one of the main signifiers in terms of your place in society. So we talked about this last week, but conspicuous consumption, huge, huge, everybody's favorite thing. And one of the things that is good about conspicuous consumption is that it does create a lot of jobs. Uh, the more things you want to buy, the more things people had to make in the first place. So it does stimulate the economy in the sense of job creation and the sense of like, you know, purchasing. Um, but it can be bad because people often end up spending their money on stuff they don't need in order to appear wealthier. Um, and this is an ages old problem. You've probably heard a lot about this lately, uh, you know, with like the stimulus checks and things like that. This idea that people are afraid that if you get too much money, you're going to use it on like garbage instead of on rent. So that was kind of one of the problems a lot of people were spending on wisely. And the other problem, of course, was that as people earned more and as they bought more, they rose in status. And the people who were already wealthy were not super into this. Uh, one of the points of being wealthy is that not everyone else is already also wealthy, you know. Um, so for them, they were a little bit concerned about all of these people sort of rising up out of nowhere, these little mushrooms popping up and being super wealthy overnight. So the conspicuous consumption on the one hand, very good, created another layer of the economy. On the other hand, changed things. So keep this in mind, because we are increasingly moving towards equality. So this tends to be one of the things that uh, gets dangerous quickly. And this is one of the things that we'll talk about in discussion, this concept of whether poverty is motivational. Uh, you've probably heard people talking about poverty being motivational, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, trickle down economics. Um, and so that's one of the things that people started to argue like right at this point in time. So. The reason uh, that the, the second layer of the economy was valuable is that a lot of the people who were making stuff were not men. Uh, this tended to be something that women did. So suddenly, women have a place in the economy. So women and children at home were doing a whole separate layer of work uh, and of earning than the men were. So very often the men would leave the house and they would go work somewhere, but the women and children, and again, everybody had eight children, uh, would stay home and do stuff. Um, so they might make cider, they might uh, weave, they might make homespun cloth. Um, this woman here in the picture is spinning cloth. And I don't know if you've ever seen um, a spinning wheel in person. If you've seen Cinderella, no, no, wait, Sleeping Beauty, uh, you've probably seen a spinning wheel, but this is essentially how you used to do it. You put like kind of like a wad of fiber up there and then you gradually pull off little pieces and then spin them into yarn. It takes forever. Um, but if you were already at home all day and you didn't have anywhere to go because you're a woman and you can't go anywhere, spend some cloth. And then at the end of the day, you earn some money and that's your money or your family's money, depending. But the fact that uh, people had these sort of secondary occupations and especially that families and children had these secondary occupations was huge. Huge, huge. People weren't farming anymore. They were living in cities, but they were making stuff. And so the fact that they were making stuff led to more money. And this is where it starts to get interesting. So 
everybody is suddenly obsessed obsessed with making money. Uh, previously, this hadn't been a thing, in part because previously this hadn't been an option um, for most people, especially living in a monarchy, living in a feudal society. You didn't own your land, so you farmed as much as you could to survive, and whoever owned the land took their chunk, but you didn't have spending money. Um, you certainly didn't have an excess of money. You certainly didn't have luxury items, like you, you worked and you survived and then you died. So this, this was a game changer. This thing where you work and then you have money and then you have extra money? Big, big deal. So basically, America became a nation of traders. It became our obsession. Uh, this idea that the harder you worked, the more money you could get. Again, that might sound familiar. This idea that the more money you had, the more stuff you could buy. So they weren't a nation of savers. They were for sure a nation of spenders. Uh, but this is sort of where this idea started. This like hustle, this uh, being on that grind, this, this getting of the bread, as the raccoon says here. Uh, so Americans became like obsessed with earning money and spending and earning and spending. And everybody else thought this was super tacky. Um, and a lot of cultures, like they still weren't doing this kind of thing. And they were like, why? Like, what are you... Like this is gross. Um, in, in this sense, this is still true. Um, a lot of people who come from other countries when they come to America are kind of alarmed by how obsessed Americans are with consuming and with earning. Um, Americans are known for talking openly about money in a way that other cultures don't, um, and talking openly sometimes about, about salary and about earning, especially in a way that other cultures don't. And this was the beginning of that, this idea that having uh, a surplus of money meant that you had a surplus of like all the good things in the world. So this became like one of our massive social changes, this idea that every person has something to buy, has something to sell, they have business to do. The biggest thing that helped this thing uh, sort of explode was paper money. So You've probably seen the way that like previous cultures traded. Uh, we have a lot of coins left over from ancient cultures. Coins were a very big deal. But paper money had some major influences because paper money meant, for one, you didn't have to barter. Uh, bartering is sort of our, our oldest form of exchanging goods, you know, so you might go to the, sto the store, the market, uh, and you're like, all right, well, I have a dozen eggs, but what I want is a pint of milk, and you would, you know, you, the chicken person, trade with the cow person, uh, and then there you are. But money means that you don't have to, like, carry a lot of stuff with you. So if you wanted to go to the market and sell, like, a bunch of cows, uh, you no longer have to, like, bring all of your cows. <laughs> you, can, you can just trade for outright paper money. So paper money was huge because, one, it, like, limited the amount of stuff you had to carry around all the time. So you could travel with money in a way that you could not travel with, like, all of your sheep. But also, you didn't need to know somebody to sell them something. So in the olden days, with, with bartering and with trade, um, it was very dependent on your reputation. It was very dependent on who you knew and whether you thought they were selling you, like, sick cows or something like that. But with paper money, it's like you walk up and you're like, I would like to buy the thing. You hand the person some money, they hand you the thing. It's over. You don't need to know that guy. And also, the third thing, that money was good everywhere. Um, I'll show you. Well, actually, I'll show you now. This is um, a dollar bill from Maryland. Isn't it gorgeous? Um, so paper money used to be a lot bigger. Um, well, our money keeps getting smaller, but it used to be like, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty large. Like your, your bill fold uh, would be like a serious leather folder. Um, so you would have money that could be exchanged normally at very specific banks, but gradually at more and more banks. So in the beginning, it would be like, yes, this is, this is Maryland dollars, and they're only good in Maryland. Um, but as time went on, you could use your Maryland dollars in Pennsylvania, which was major, you know what I mean? So the amount of money that you could carry around was suddenly very large, and it was also suddenly very standard. Um, you know, there wasn't like that exchange rate that you might run into, like, well, how much are chickens worth in this town versus that town? It was like, no, this dollar is worth one dollar. So in a sense, it contributed to the loosening of bonds. Um, once again, you can suddenly trade with people who are outside your kin network, you can trade with people you've never seen before, you can trade with people you'll never see again. So it did lend itself to a little sketchiness, but it was also fast and steady and impersonal. So here we are, a bunch of strangers trading money, no problem. It was a game changer. Um, the other thing was that as people earned, 
they tended to get excited about earning and earn more and more and more. So there had to be suddenly a limit, essentially, on how far you could raise in the ranks of society. So if you remember previously, everything was kind of equaling out. Everybody was like, you were either, you know, a gentleman or a commoner, but the commoners were starting to rise. Well, now the commoners are really starting to rise, um, especially as they get big patches of land. So if you can imagine, if you came over on a boat and you would just, you know, went south until you found several thousand acres, for instance, in North Carolina, you could just be like, well, this is my land now and grow a bunch of tobacco and send it back and forth. And within a matter of years, you could be really, really wealthy. Um, like you, you know, people were, were gaining their wealth at a rate we had never seen before um, with tobacco for sure, uh, with gold, with silver, like people were finding things and selling them and it was kind of epic. Uh, so suddenly all of these people are just sort of rising up through the ranks and the people who had gotten there first, the landed gentry were again, straight up horrified. This is not what they meant. Uh, when they wanted equality, they wanted like, ambiguous emotional legal equality they didn't mean that everyone should be rich uh, this was like a real surprise so basically it would, they were kind of horrified and they were no longer able to control society in the way that they had been like they set up a world in which everyone could be equal and then people started becoming equal and they were all surprised pikachu you know so this was like a real bizarre sort of moment so people were starting to get real rich real fast um, and they were called mushrooms which I love. I don't think we call people mushrooms anymore, and we should. Um, but if you've heard people talk about this, like sort of difference between new money and old money, this is a, in, in a sense what they're talking about. This is a very old problem. So basically, social bonds are loosening, geographical bonds are loosening, paper money is everywhere, and a bunch of people are getting rich all of a sudden. So, everybody doing okay? Any questions about chapter eight? I hear nothing. Either you're all asleep or my sound is broken or you have no questions. I don't know which one it is. Let's talk about chapter 10. Um, so, chapter 10. This one is more about political revolution. So, um, one of the things that the book points out, which is actually kind of exciting, is that usually before a revolution, there's a lot of political unrest. Uh, usually a revolution takes a huge amount of incitement. Um, and I thought this was really interesting because some of the stuff that Dr. Wood lists um, are things about mass poverty, uh, seething social discontent, grinding oppression, like stop me when it sounds familiar. Right? Like, you know, we're sort of in the middle of a social revolution right now. I imagine when we look back on this in several hundred years, we will talk about, uh, you know, the summer of 2020 as a moment of social revolution. And isn't this us? The mass poverty, the seething social discontent, the grinding oppression. Uh, so we are set up for a revolution in terms of those social things, but they weren't. So hopefully that makes sense. So essentially, before this revolution, people were actually kind of chill. Like it was an unusual time in terms of like prosperity and enlightenment. People were making as much money as they wanted. People were getting as much land as they wanted. Like people were spreading out. I'm not saying it was equal for everybody, but it was more equal than it ever had been before. So this was an unusual thing to see right before a revolution. Usually right before a revolution, like shit has to get dark. Uh, but here, people really just wanted to keep going up. People had like gotten a taste of the good life and they wanted to keep going. So all of this money that they had um, was sort of, was, was new money and they were afraid of it being taken away. So in large part, the revolution was about keeping the wealth that they had only just recently got. So all of these little mushrooms had gotten all of this money and all of this land, but it was new and they were worried. They were like, oh shit, they might take this from us. Um, and that was not an irrational fear. Like that was something that people had seen before. So what we're seeing is that everybody is sort of escalating and they want to hold on to this escalation. Uh, the rich are for sure getting richer. Uh, the people who were previously the middle class, like especially the artisans are becoming the, the upper class. And even the people who were at the lowest class were becoming okay. Um, there were still like, you know, super poor people, but it used to be that there were like three super poor people and like 97, or sorry, there were three rich people and 97 poor people, but now it was sort of changing. Now it was more like, uh, you know, 20% really wealthy, maybe like a 70% like, okay, and then another 10% indigent. So that was unusual. That was like a really good place to be. And so people didn't want to lose that. They wanted to like stay uh, and keep all their wealth. So one of the ways that they did that was that they started to reject the people who had previously held them down. 
So in the book, we talked about this a little bit already, this idea that we were not bringing titles with us and we weren't bringing the concept of aristocracy with us. So this is John Adams. We're going to see a lot of John Adams in this chapter. John Adams kept a lot of uh, journals and he wrote a lot of letters, which in retrospect is great because we know what John Adams thought about everything. Uh, but if you see him being sort of over quoted, this is why he, he, he wrote down a lot of things. So he said, idolatry to monarchs and servility to aristocratical pride was never so totally eradicated from so many minds in so short a time. Uh, so this is, you know, a very fancy way of saying like the people were no longer impressed by the aristocracy. Just, they weren't, they weren't really feeling it anymore. Um, so this was not just political, this was very much a social change. Because you used to have a lot of weight if you could walk into the room and be like, oh, I'm Baron such and such. But like, you know, in these, in these colonies, if you walked into a room and tried to introduce yourself as Baron such and such, they would all be like, you know, like it wasn't a thing that you could bring with you. So this rejection of aristocracy was social, yes, but it was also political. Because essentially, people got obsessed with sort of upselling themselves. Um, so one of the things that the aristocracy was worried about was that people were changing the words that they used to describe themselves. Um, so people started calling themselves yeomen. Uh, so a yeoman is basically anybody who owns land, but typically it means a little tiny bit of land. So a yeoman is basically a, like a small time farmer. And it's, it's still cool. You still own land, but it's not like that cool. But one of the things that they're starting to notice, again, here's John Adams, is that all persons under the degree of gentlemen are styled yeomen, including those who have never owned an inch of ground in their lives. Uh, so here's John Adams being really salty, that basically there used to be a series of social categories, and now there's like gentlemen and everybody else, and everybody else has essentially escalated themselves to yeomen. So they used to be like gentlemen, gentlemen farmers, landowners, maybe some yeomen, maybe some poor people, and now everybody considers themselves yeoman. So this is pretty common still in American culture. Um, generally speaking, if you ask an American what social class they're in, they will all tell you middle class. Americans love to be middle class, um, and this is increasingly not true. Uh, the middle class has, has steadily shrunk over the last couple of decades, um, and so the reality is that most of the people who describe themselves as middle class are either working class uh, or sort of like a lower middle class, if you will. But what we mean by that, of course, changes, and this is kind of that same thing. These people are kind of giving themselves airs, but they're also kind of reframing what it means to be a guy with a little tiny bit of land. Um, this carving is of a yeoman. I kind of I kind of dig him. I think he's like smoking and he's got a shepherd's hook. Uh, so this idea that people were styling themselves yeoman, like that they were sort of claiming perhaps more than they were, very American. That's our jam. So um, this is again what we just talked about. This idea that they wanted to hold on to this wealth. They just got it. They love it so much. They're gonna stab a bitch to keep it. Like this is this is again also very American. So they had gotten all this money real fast, they knew they could lose it real fast, so they needed to control the world around them. And one of the ways that they did that was entering into the political scheme. So previously, um, the only people who could really become politicians were the wealthy people. Uh, they had to be, you know, the sons of people who were already politicians, uh, they had to be well educated, and again, we're still for sure only talking about white men anyway. Um, but what we're starting to see now is that as people gain in wealth and they gain in social status, they start to get involved. They start to think, maybe I should be a lawyer, maybe I should be the mayor. And so what we're starting to see is that these like ordinary people are rising up in the political ranks. Um, we start to see a lot of people who represent certain factions. Uh, we start to see a lot of people who have like strong local followings. And this is scary for the established uh, wealthy gentlemen because they had been really used to just like kind of running the show and then like the poor people would not bother them. But now the poor people are talking. Uh, and they're forming groups, they're forming factions, they're forming um, a lot of these, these like uh, opposition factions. So basically a faction is a social group is, that typically has at least one very, very strong stance. Um, and you might consider Republicans and Democrats factions if they were even smaller than that. Maybe you could consider like a liberal democrats of action or something like that. So what we're seeing is that there are these little groups of politicians and now there are these groups rising up solely to oppose them. Um, so it's getting really contentious. 
And we're also seeing a lot of people with Whig ideals. Um, so the Whig party was like a really progressive British party. I mean, progressive at the time, right? Like they thought that women should be educated and that maybe also poor people should read, which again, at the time, very progressive. Um, and so we're starting to see these people with these like liberal, uh, like, bleeding heart you know, sort of things uh, rise up in power. So basically the normals um, who believe that normal people are people and should have like benefits are starting to enter the, like, the, the political ranks. And again, they had not seen this before. Politics had been kept solely to like, you know, four or five dudes and their sons. But now, change. We're kind of seeing this again now, uh, especially in the last four years about, like since 2016, we've seen a record number um, of people running for office who we normally wouldn't see, but people of color, women, uh, people who were not, you know, excessively well-educated, like we're really starting to see people participate in politics again. So this is sort of uh, back, this is sort of on their eyes one more time. So the British Crown well, saw this happening. They saw all of these normal people entering into politics and pushing these ideals that would benefit the poor and would benefit um, basically anyone who was an aristocracy. And they were like, oh no, oh no. You know, they had done it their way for hundreds of years. They were not into this thing where these mushrooms came in and told them what to do. So they started doing some kind of shady shit. And again, stop me when this sounds familiar. Uh, they started limiting popular representation by redrawing the district so that it looked like you needed fewer representatives. They started limiting attendance at assemblies. So essentially what they used to have um, with these like giant town assemblies and they would come together and like discuss the issues. And what they started doing was being like, uh, oh no, only 15 of us will fit in the room. Mm, sorry. Uh, they started straight out vetoing laws that had been passed at assemblies. So maybe even though the attendance at the assembly had been restricted, you had one anyway, and passed a law that everybody liked, the people at the higher level would be like, mm, no. This is again, very similar to what we're seeing uh, with the current contentious relationship between the House and the Senate. And they also started strengthening the roles of certain people who were um, essentially sponsored by the king. So there were people who had quote, royal roles, these sort of like courtiers, and basically they would come in and they were representatives of the king and also they reported back to the king and they started strengthening the amount of strength I'm sorry they started like strengthening their roles the amount of responsibility they had the amount of power they had um so again familiar now uh so this is kind of an interesting way that the crown is fighting back the crown is like listen we actually don't want y'all to participate like if you could just like uh go back to your farm and so to do that they restricted voting they restricted assemblies uh they messed with the representation and they started giving power to people who the people did not want in power nothing new under the sun my babies um however what we start to see is that the people who wanted power, the mushrooms, the, the common people, they saw this happening and they were like, oh no, thank you, please. Um, so even though the crown was starting this whole thing with manipulating the laws, voter fraud, uh, the common people rose up. So what we see is that the common people are looking at this and they're looking at this king and they're looking at the way he runs his monarchy and they're like, oh, this is some bullshit. Like, this is super corrupt. Um, he's doing a bad job. He's spending money on all the wrong things. He's trying to tell us what to do, and he doesn't even know us. You know, like, again, it was very similar uh, to kind of what's going on now. Like, revolutions are revolutions. Um, so they were kind of looking at this king and, oops, sorry, uh, looking at themselves and thinking, you know, like, this is not working. Uh, this king does not represent us. He does not represent our interests. Um, he's spending our money in stupid ways. Um, he's taxing us on stuff we don't even want to be taxed on. We are not into this anymore. So this was one of the one of the big things, one of the major social changes. Like we talked about the social changes, and this is again one of the the social changes that turned into a political change. They looked at the king and they were like, "Oh, we no longer want to participate." So. They started dividing themselves into factions. Um, and what we ended up with in large part were essentially the Patriots and the Courtiers. Um, so the Patriots were basically the colonists and the Courtiers were the royal representatives. And the reason that this is important is that historically, when people had divided themselves into categories, especially prior to a revolution, they divided themselves into rich and poor. But here, what we're seeing is that they divided themselves essentially into like American and British. They didn't call themselves that yet because like 
they were still all British, uh, but they had, they had divided themselves. And so this is kind of um, how John Adams, I know, but John Adams, uh, how, he, how he explained it. He said, the Patriots, a real Patriot is the most illustrious character in human life. Is it not the interest and happiness of his fellow creatures, his care? Um, so essentially, his argument is that a real patriot uh, cares about the other people in his town, he cares about the commoners, he cares about making a better world, as compared to the courtiers. Those who applied themselves to passions and prejudices, the follies and vices of great men, in order to obtain their smiles, esteem, and patronage, and consequently, their favors and preferments. So, patriots are people who care for the little people, courtiers are people who are like, bootlickers they're like the sort of um, like subordinates uh, to the powerful so that they're the courtiers are basically the people who are like sitting around waiting to be granted a favor like they think that if they do a good enough job and tell the right secrets and bring the right information that maybe they'll get uh, patronage maybe they'll get esteem maybe they'll get preferments so essentially I go back to this one it was not down to poor and, and rich it was down to like good person bad person and was it really like, I don't know, like you can't, you, you for sure, you can't really say that like a person who considered themselves a patriot was a better person than someone who considered themselves uh, a courtier, but it's part of how they understood themselves at the time. So again, in regard to historical perspectives, they understood these two divides. Uh, these people on the left, obviously, patriots, chilling, reading newspapers, making stuff. This guy on the right, obviously a courtier. Extremely well-dressed, doesn't look like he knows how to do anything. Interestingly, they both have spaniels, which I'm into. Uh, but this idea of you are either serving the crown or you are serving us was vital. So this divide, um, this, this social divide, was basically how the colonists began to understand their place in the world. You are either one of us or you're one of them. So. The loyalists, the courtiers, um, saw this happening and they were like, oh, God. <laughs> and a lot of them just straight up left. They just got back on boats, uh, back to England or to other parts of the British Empire. Um, probably about 20% about of the population was loyalist. So there weren't as many of them as we think, but they were powerful. So it's sort of like when we talk about like, oh, how many really rich people are there in America? Not that many, but they're the only people we see on TV. So we kind of lose sight of that, if that makes sense. Um, so they're, the people who were loyalists were the most powerful. And when they left, there was kind of a vacuum. So when they left, they left a lot of like powerful social positions open. They left a lot of powerful political positions open. Suddenly we needed more members of the legislature. We needed more judges. We needed more lawyers and doctors. We needed more like society matrons. Um, and who rose to fill it? Mushrooms. So this is one of our big, again, American changes. Basically, we sent back all the loyalists. We were like, y'all can just go on um, and we put in their place a different kind of person uh, specifically uh, a patriot a, a colonial american and so pretty good pretty good stuff major changes basically we're starting to change our idea about what we want to see and we're starting to enact that idea of what we want to see oh a lot of the uh, loyalists came back eventually they like left for the war and then they came back later but whatever so this is kind of where we're at now. Uh, here again, John Adams. Any position that came from any source that talent and the will of the people now seemed undeserved and dependent. So essentially we're talking about uh, like a meritocracy. So instead of an aristocrat, aristocracy, sorry, uh, which is where you inherit your, your, like your position and your power, we're talking about a meritocracy, which is where the best person gets the position and the power. And this is also super American. This is one of our like major American ideals. It isn't always true. Uh, I imagine you've noticed by now that the wealthy people rise to the top faster than the poor people. Uh, but it's one of our favorite ideas. It's one of the things that we really hold on to. Like we love an underdog. Um, so basically we are starting to say, you, if you want to hold a position of power, like if you want to be the mayor of our town, you need to be good at it. Like you can't just be some rich dude's son anymore. You need to be a person that we respect. You need to be a person that we voted for. Like basically, if you have the talent and the will to do something, we'll let you. Uh, but we're no longer just going to let you just because your dad is like some guy. So essentially, royal patronage out, moral character in. 
right. So as you can see, this slide has stars, that means it's important. Um, and I apologize for the wall of text, but every once in a while, um, something is just so beautiful that I have to give it to you in a wall of text. And this is kind of the thesis statement of this chapter. It is in this context that we can best understand the revolutionaries appeal to independence, not just the independence of the country from Great Britain, but more important, the independence of individuals from personal influence and from quote, warm and private friendship. So essentially all of your power used to become, or sorry, used to be sourced from uh, people who were, who were powerful, more powerful than you. So essentially this warm and private friendship, these days when we talk about it, it's maybe like cronyism, like the idea that you as, um, you know, the governor give contracts to your friends. That used to be the way that we distributed power. But the Americans are suddenly obsessed with independence. We no longer want to have, you know, great mother Britain, and we no longer want to have like daddy patriarch. We want to be our own humans out of the world, doing our own thing and achieve everything by merit. Super American. So keep this, this, this beautiful sentence in mind. Why did we want independence? It was twofold. We wanted independence from Britain. We wanted independence from like rich guys telling us what to do. The other thing uh, to think in about these, these mushrooms to keep in mind is that one of the things that everybody was kind of obsessed with was property. And this was for sure a measure of wealth. Like we were very concerned with like, do you have so much money that you own property? But it was also a measure of independence because a person who had property in this world was not dependent on someone else. So if, if you have property, again, we're measuring your wealth, but we're also measuring the degree to which you are like your own man. Um, and I, I think this might be sort of easy to think about as a, as a metaphor for like dating as a young person. Um, a person who has their own apartment has a lot more independence than a person who lives with their parents. Um, so like if you, if you were trying to measure like the wealth or the status of a person knowing that they have their own place is a thing. It indicates that they have a job and can afford the place and it also indicates that they can do whatever they want at their place and their mom's not going to like, you know, come kick you out in the morning. So. Any person, well, and again, person is just white men, sorry, but any man who had property was essentially considered his own man. He was his own being. He could do what he believed to be important. Um, and so having your own property was symbolic of having your independence. And you might argue that this is still true. I'd be interested to hear what you think on Thursday. Um, it used to be, like it used to be the American dream, right? That you, you had your house, your 2.5 kids, your job, your car, um, but Americans don't really buy houses anymore, at least the younger generations. Like I'm, I'm a elder millennial and we no longer buy anything because we're so poor. Uh, so it's hard to say whether this is still necessarily true in terms of like ownership, ownership, but it was vital at the time. Wealth, independence. Because of our obsession um, with this, with this independence and with this wealth, we end up with two social classes. And again, John Adams was a little salty about this because previously we had had like a series of social classes with himself at the top. And he said, there are but two sorts of men in the world, free men and slaves. Wow, I wrote sobs. Anyway, that word is slaves. Um, so essentially, everyone has divided themselves into just two categories. Um, and it's also important to remember that these are not 50-50 categories. Um, it's like the free men and the slaves. And this meant that if there were only two categories to belong to, and most of you belong to one category, most of you were equal. So now we're looking at this idea, like is, is a man who owns an acre equal? to a man who owns a thousand acres. Ooh, like they're both homeowners, they're both free, they're both members of a democratic uh, government, well, they're about to be. Um, so like, are they equal humans? So what we know for sure is that uh, slaves are out. No more slaves, like servitude, out, dumb, we hate it now, independence, all the rage. So we become concerned with merit. Uh, we become concerned with home ownership. And I think, again, um, this, this idea that the men are equal and they deserve as much as they're willing to work for becomes one of our key American ideas. So here's a couple of people talking about it. Um, so this is not Dave Ramsey, the travel host. This is a man from hundreds of years ago named David Ramsey. Uh, but he said, even the reins of state may be held by the song of the poorest men. If, oops, that was supposed to be the son of the poorest men if possessed of abilities equal to their important station. 
So essentially, it used to be that if you wanted to be the governor, you had to come from a long line of aristocratic people. But now, even if your father was just some tobacco farmer, you could be the governor. Revolutionaries considered, quote, a man's merit to rest entirely within himself uh, without any regard to family, blood, or connection. So um, it's here. Like, this is, this is one of our biggest American ideals. Your merit is not about your family. Your merit is about yourself. Uh, you're probably familiar with Thomas Paine. Um, if you were in my 201 class, we read his uh, pamphlet. And he said, virtue is not hereditary. It's good shit, right? So American. This is the kind of thing that, uh, like, ultimately makes me feel kind of patriotic. It's very hard to be patriotic right now. There's a lot, there's a lot wrong. Um, but these, these inherent American ideals, I think we're really on the right track. I think the issue with what's going on with America right now is that we've gotten away from these ideals um, and we've gone back to a sort of like corrupt uh, monarchy system. But if we think about these ideals, if we think like, oh, this is what America is supposed to be, um, I think it really is kind of patriotic. This is great. Like we, we should do this. And you can tell everyone I said so. So again, Zoom does not lend itself well to, uh, uh, you know, doing lecture and conversations at the same time, but we'll talk about this heavily on Thursday, this concept of, can you just be an independent man uh, without your parents? So this is kind of what ended up happening. We developed this idea of um, merit being independent of your bloodline, of, of any man who has the will and the intelligence being, you know, right for the role. And what ended up happening was that it didn't quite work in the first generation. Like they were still, you know, farmers and rich dudes, but the second generation got a lot more even. And this is also really true typically of immigrants. Uh, if you look at almost every sort of wave of American immigration, usually the first wave of immigrants are still relatively poor, they work 18 hours a day, like lots and lots of jobs, but the second generation, the reason that they're doing this whole thing, is a little bit wealthier. Uh, they're a little bit better off. They have an education, uh, they can do whatever they want. This is why so often you see immigrant parents like demanding that their children be like either doctors or lawyers or sometimes engineers. Um, it's that same sort of mindset, this idea that like, I did something hard to level the playing field for you. So whereas previously, um, I love this drawing of the soccer field, whereas previously, uh, you know, the poor people had been kicking the ball uphill, they were, they were really working to level the playing field so that the second generation would sort of start level, they would all go to school, they would all own land, they would all have an equal opportunity at becoming, you know, the top of the pile again, still white men. Uh, but this, this is kind of the idea that if we put um, all of this equality in place, if we establish these really even systems, what we would end up with is a second generation of humans who were living in a total meritocracy, that they would all be judged solely on their merit. Eh, sort of worked. In fact, it worked a little bit better than they anticipated. And one of the things that happened uh, was that the founding fathers, who again had themselves been incredibly aristocratic and wealthy white dudes, ended up losing money. Um, so as people became more equal and more educated and more like, capable of like, trade and conspicuous consumption, they leveled the field. And then what happened was the people who had previously been at the top were like level with everybody else and they did not care for this. Uh, it worked a little too well. They were, they were a little horrified. Uh, so they ended up um, equal in a way that I think they had sort of not anticipated. Like they really wanted everybody to be equal under the law. They did not anticipate that their sons would no longer inherit their privilege. Um, and again, this may sound familiar, right? Uh, so they ended up, uh, and in some ways, a little bit worse off than they started. Uh, the primogeniture stopped. Primogeniture is when the eldest son inherits everything. So they started, you know, dispersing their land and their wealth among all their sons and daughters, uh, which made everybody just a little bit less wealthy. Um, they started dispersing, you know, their money everywhere, and then other people started rising up. So gradually, this equality really did happen, um, and they were like this cat, like that backfired. Um, so this is one example that I thought was really interesting. In the book, he talked about the way that even um, the manner in which we painted portraits changed. So on the left, uh, you can see a pre-revolution portrait, um, and the father, almost always, in these kinds of portraits, was standing and in the center. Um, this guy, of course, off to the right. But you can see that he's literally taller than everybody else in the family. Um, he's, he's, like, he's got a position of importance. The eye sort of goes to him. Um, there's a lot of other weird things happening in this painting, but let's... <laughs> 
bit worried about it. Uh, if we look at the painting on the right, on the other hand, uh, you can see that this is a much more equal family. Um, the father, who presumably is this far left dude, is sitting down. He's on level with his wife and his daughters. Uh, there's a son there in the background, but even he is in the back and he's leaning. Um, there's a portrait of an even older white man on the wall, but basically it's a much more sort of egalitarian family portrait. So we switched from everybody set up right and dad's in the middle to everybody like, you know, kind of chill and we'll all be on the same level. So it was, again, in terms of like art history, sort of symbolic of the bigger cultural changes that were happening. So as equality began to be a thing, um, a lot of people's positions in society changed. So for one thing, female autonomy went way up. To be fair, it was a low bar. <laughs> they went from like, uh, you know, trapped in the house full time to trapped in the house part time. But like, um, a lot of the things that changed were very, very positive. Um, so females were allowed to have land. Uh, they were allowed to have their own money. Um, they were allowed to divorce. Divorce is one of our sort of weird American social traditions. Um, and for a while it was legal and then it was not legal and then it was legal again. Um, at this point in history, you did still have to have like a, a good reason to divorce. Really up until the 70s, you pretty much had to prove um, abuse or cheating or uh, you know, financial abuse. But basically women were allowed to be people to an extent. They were allowed to have money, they were allowed to have property, they were allowed to enter into business contracts. Uh, if they had a really shitty husband, they could divorce him. So women are starting to like gain in prominence. It was starting to, to be like a much better picture for the female members of society. Um, it was also, weirdly enough, starting to be kind of beneficial to the people who previously had been servants. So part of this, this drop in servitude extended to the literal servants. Uh, so no longer did people want to be servants to the crown, but also no longer did people want to be servants to anybody, kind of. So we started seeing the, the servants demand changes. Um, for instance, they stopped using the word master uh, and mistress, and they started using the word like boss. Um, so if you think about it, you've probably not heard anybody call somebody master or mistress in a long time, unless it was, you know, like in a BDSM context, which is its own thing. Uh, and that's because it just it straight up went out of fashion, because people didn't like the extent to which it, like, separated the rungs of society. So we started hearing people say things like boss or, like, ma'am. Um, the servants themselves were harder to find, because a lot of people, once their indentured servitude contract ended, just peaced out and bought their own land and moved out. So it was harder to find somebody who was willing to be a servant, who was willing to do hard work. And a lot of the servants started asking for money. Um, previously, you would have almost everybody had a servant and they worked essentially for like room and board. But now all these servants are like, oh, we're not doing that anymore. Uh, we want money. We want to literally sit at the table. That was the whole thing. Uh, we want to like call you by a different kind of name. Uh, we want days off. Mm. So they were getting uh, kind of, you know, kind of uppity, uh, which is what the aristocrats said at the time. They were becoming people, right? But the aristocrats were very upset. Um, this led to a massive change in employment. So a lot of people stopped being servants or apprentices and started becoming just straight up employees. So it used to be that, um, especially if you, if you had a trade, you would get a little apprentice, you know, like a 12 or 13 year old boy, and he would live with your family. Um, and again, you didn't pay him, but you housed him and gave him all his food and taught him a trade. And then when he reached a certain age, usually like 18 or 20 ish, you would like release him into the world to be his own man. But no, not anymore. Now the guy comes to your house, learns, and then goes home at night. And also you have to pay him. So like, like this was a brand new thing, this idea that you don't own the people. Um, so the, the apprentices were sort of like, that was sort of on the outs. Um, people thought, started to call them employers instead of masters again. Um, and basically they started to identify as, again, independent humans. Um, they started to have unions. Uh, they started to have meetings. Um, in fact, they would have meetings that the masters weren't allowed to come to, if you can imagine. Uh, so basically, they, they started considering themselves as on level with their employers, except for the fact that they were working and not paying. Um, so depending on the kind of jobs that you've had in the past, this might sound familiar. This idea that you as an employee deserved rights. You deserved breaks and money and water and to leave. Uh, so this was sort of the start in making Americans hard to hire. Uh, one of the reasons that everybody sort of goes um, overseas, that we've seen like such a huge rise in production overseas, is because Americans are super demanding. 
we always want, you know, safe workspaces and like weekends and, uh, you know, lunch breaks, uh, whereas in other cultures, they haven't quite invented that yet. And this was the beginning of that. This was the beginning of like unionization and workers rights and things that have ultimately become incredibly important to us. Uh, ultimately, we're really grateful for this as Americans, but at the time it was still like, <laughs> they made that noise, I think. Um, unfortunately, these changes did not uh, extend to the outright slaves. Um, there were still a lot um, of outright slaves, especially black slaves, who had not signed indentured servitude contracts. I should make that very clear. Um, so these like shaping values, these changing values in terms of like equality and enlightenment only went so far and then like hit a hard wall. So they had started making room for poor men. All right. All right. For like women. All right. All right. Like maybe even young men. Okay. Okay. But it hit a really hard wall at black people. Um, so these were also <laughs> people, <laughs> It's hard sort of to, to talk about now because of course we're right in the middle of it again. Um, but you, you could argue that this was really the beginning of that. Like a lot of people came over as indentured servants, which is not the same as slaves. And a lot of people came over as slaves, but we still made the slaves stay slaves and let everybody else become people. So while I was just saying, like it's kind of great to look at these um, you know, amazing ancient patriotic ideals, it is important to remember that we have since the beginning uh, just straight up and stepping on black people. So even though people were walking around talking about like, oh, all men are created equal, somehow it was like men, asterisk, um, and it was something that was so normalized at the time that people didn't even think about it. So like, did the founding fathers have slaves? Yes. Uh, were slaves considered people? No. So even though gradually we're expanding our social bounds, we're still not giving literally everyone the kind of social consideration that we act like we were. So yeah, things were better for servants. Things were just definitely not better for slaves. Um, that said, people had thought about abolition. The concept was in place um, and the Quakers were starting to practice it. So it was like, imagined like people were starting to think about it but they weren't necessarily enacting it and they certainly weren't enacting it in the south um sometimes in the in the northern colonies you might see a little bit of like abolitionists floating around but uh certainly not in the southern colonies so this was the beginning of that problem so in summation rebellion against servitude generally led to rebellion against the crown specifically okay I'm sorry, I keep hitting my little microphone, which I assume makes a terrible noise. Um, any questions so far? I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen and look at your little faces. Everybody doing okay? I can only see two faces. Two faces, you guys are okay? This is still recording? Sound works? Excellent. Okay. All right. <sighs> I missed the classroom. All right. So let's, oh, look, all these little hands. Oh, I love it. I didn't know you guys could all do that. So let's go back to our last chapter. All right, here we are, interests. So brief review, here's what we've seen happening so far. Um, the norms are changing. All of our norms are changing. Our social norms are changing. Our political norms are changing. Our monetary norms are changing. And we're changing all of our ideas about like nobility uh, and aristocracy and monarchy. So as a brief review, everything is in flux. What we're gonna talk about in this chapter is basically self-interest. So here we go. We did not invent democracy, as you know, from core and core and core and core and core, but we were one of the first countries in the world to start allowing, quote, common people to vote. Um, so basically, once we got to the colonies, we started espousing these democratic ideals. And instead of just letting the educated elite vote, which had been, you know, pretty popular, even, even once people invented democracy, it still didn't mean everybody. So instead of just letting those people vote, we started letting ordinary people vote, like people whose fathers were nobody, people who didn't have a lot of money. And this was a game changer. Again, this is one of our, like, American things. Um, so we started letting pretty much anybody who wanted to uh, run for office, which was itself a massive game changer, because again, previously you had to have a great deal of money and the right, you know, family. So we started just like letting people participate. Like you want to be the mayor, like, uh, yeah, go on. 
like you want to vote like oh yeah go on uh it was it was unusually democratic in that regard so people started voting uh people started caring they started thinking about the power of their vote and like the things that they could do with it so what ends up happening is that these groups form these factions that i was talking about earlier um, but a way of thinking about these factions is that essentially they were social interest groups so like all of the you know cattle farmers would come together and be like you know what we need is new laws about cows you know and then like all of the manufacturers would come together and be like hey you know what we need is like different tariffs on manufacturing and then they would form these groups, these voting blocks, these special interest groups, and they would vote together. And this was a massive way to affect change. Um, you've probably heard something like this in modern politics. We do talk about special interest groups a lot. Um, very often now they have lobbyists whose sole job is to be sort of the middleman between like the people and you know the senator. Uh, being a lobbyist, by the way, a great job if you can get it, lots of money. So basically, people started to join these special interest groups and they started to vote with these special interest groups. So now instead of just voting like how you felt as an individual human, you would vote based on how you saw yourself in society. Um, so you and all the other whatever voted similarly. Um, so we start to see these like sort of spokesmen emerging, these people who again previously would have been nobody. These were mushrooms, but we start to see them like rising up out of nowhere and being like, I am here representing, uh, you know, the Cobblers Guild, and this is how all of the Cobblers feel. And it was a game changer um, because basically people felt represented. They felt like they could make change. They felt like uh, they had some sort of say in the government in a way that they just really, really didn't before. So this representation of interest, um, vital. So often what ends up happening is that as a human, you have more than one interest because, um, you know, we are, we are complex, we contain multitudes. Uh, so one of the things that started to happen was that each individual representative, like let's say each state senator, had multiple interest groups talking to him. So what you ended up with ideally was pluralist representation. And what that means is that you advocate on behalf of more than one group. So you, as a state senator, might advocate on behalf of the cobblers, and you might also advocate on behalf of the dairy farmers, um, because you are capable of believing two things at once, right? So the pluralist interest, in a sense, could be really, really helpful, um, because one person could represent, like, everybody from their town. This is one of the things we talk about a lot with states' rights, uh, or, like, small government, the idea that um, the person who is representing you represents you specifically. So this, honestly, was great. This is great. Uh, this is like what we want from democracy. This idea that um, our representative is doing what we want them to do. And they're doing it because we told them to. Like that's the whole point of representative democracy. It's like, listen, I'm not gonna go there to DC, but you are, and this is what you're gonna vote on. So we start to see this sort of rising up. This idea that people are voting in their self-interest, but perhaps they have more than one self-interest. So they end up with pluralist representation. Okay, so. Here, we're back with the stars, and you remember what the stars mean? Thesis. So this is essentially the thesis statement of this uh, chapter. Self-interest is the grand principle of all human actions, and it is unreasonable and vain to expect service from a man who must act contrary to his own interest to perform it. So this is from the New York Artisans Guild in 1760. So essentially, they were a group of artisans who had gotten together and said like, we need to do what's best for us, for us, the artisans. And they said this, like, just shockingly, gorgeously true. This is, again, so American, that it is unreasonable to expect someone to vote against their self-interest, um, that all humans are really just self-interested at heart. And um, those of you who are psychology majors probably have a lot to say about this. But basically, they were saying, we are going to vote because we have that power, and we are going to vote in our own self-interest because that's what's good for us. So this starts um, essentially kind of identity politics, but also the concept that we vote in our self-interest. We vote for the representative who's going to make the changes we want to see. Uh, we vote for the representative who makes the best, like, you know, sort of campaign speeches, who looks the most like us. Like, this is very, very American, the idea that we are voting in our self-interest. Um, sometimes we don't. That gets weird. But essentially, democracy is about voting for your self-interest. So here it is very American. So 
the problem with everybody voting for their own self-interest uh, and with common people running for office and with, again, like the sons of common people becoming suddenly very powerful was that they didn't anticipate that. And so all of this like self-interest and all of this self-promotion was really shocking to the people who had been in charge previously. Um, so this is William Drayton, who was um, like one of the sort of upwardly mobile, like, like one, one of the old money people. And he was horrified by the participation of common people in politics. And he said, nature never intended that such men should be profound politicians or able statesmen. Will a man in his right senses be directed by an illiterate person in the prosecution of a lawsuit? So essentially, the people that they had previously assumed to be beneath them were now equal with them, and in some cases, above them. And this was real scary. Real scary. This idea that we should listen to somebody who had previously been poor, that we should listen to somebody who had previously been illiterate, or might still be illiterate, because most business was conducted out loud at this point. But you can see with William Drayton, I mean, he's straight up horrified. And I think, again, this is very surprised Pikachu, which is my personal favorite meme. Uh, this idea that we said everybody was equal, and then suddenly everybody was equal, and they're all just like, <laughs> like it was it was like a, a massive social shift um, that they should have seen coming but I think they didn't think it would work or something like that so everyone is voting in their own self-interest everyone is rising up and the people who had previously been at the top are like oh shit uh, we did not think this through <laughs> you know like they had intended to stay at the top and instead they were equal so I think this is, again, like a really American thing. We see this repeated over and over, but with different groups, right? Like, oh, should we listen to a woman? Is she gonna lead us? Like, oh, should we listen to a black person? Is he gonna lead us? And it's like, yeah, bitch. Like when you said all men are created equal, this is what it said. And again, man, asterisk. Uh, but this is, again, like such an American thing, this idea that we, we didn't realize we were opening it up to everybody and then when everybody started caring, things started changing, and it was very scary for the educated elite. Um, again, stop me when this sounds familiar, right? So, part of the way that people were acting in their self-interest um, was accumulating as much wealth as possible, and this was happening right when we really start the Revolutionary War. So, war is incredibly good for the economy, which is so dark. Uh, like, it's, 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 really unfortunate, and it would be so much better for humanity if it were the other way around, but basically, um, war is just great for the economy. It's really good for industry. Um, if you go to war, you need a bunch of stuff, you need a bunch of food, you need a bunch of weapons, you need a bunch of outfits. Um, increasingly, you need a bunch of weapons, um, and our weapons get more and more and more expensive. At this point, I mean, yes, a musket was expensive, but at this point, weapons were not our main concern. These days, they are. The stealth planes are millions of dollars, but these days, the Revolutionary War provided a lot of jobs, essentially, which again is so gross, but here we are. Um, so the Revolutionary War lasted a really, really long time because uh, we just kept having battles and then we would not have battles for a while and then we would have another battle. Like they would just stop over the winter. Um, so it went on for like eight years-ish um, and a lot of people were involved, maybe about one in 10 men. And bear in mind, you could pay someone to be involved for you if you didn't want to. So basically, the fact that it was so long lasting and the fact that so many people participated meant that we needed a bunch of stuff um we needed a bunch of food we needed a bunch of weapons and so as our boy thomas Paine says i love thomas Paine, the necessities of an army create new trade so all the people in the house who had been making stuff for conspicuous consumption now start making stuff for the war effort so people start making um, you know, blankets instead of clothes. They start making rum because soldiers love rum, and also it can be disinfectant. Uh, people start making guns. They start planting extra food and then selling their extra food. So it's a massive change in the economy. But one of the things that happened was that we didn't really have enough money to fix that. Um, so humans started doing this thing uh, that we do every once in a while, which is always a terrible idea, which is literally print more money. Um, so, to be fair, macroeconomics is deeply complicated, um, and it exists really in like five dimensions, um, but it's, it, the only thing that you really need to know is that you cannot just print more paper dollars, uh, because then they don't have any value. Um, historically in America, we have held our, our money versus gold, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, so when the government literally printed just new pieces of paper money, it went poorly 
surprise Pikachu. Um, so basically, once the war was over, the economy straight up changed. People had made a bunch of money in the lead up to the war. They had sold a bunch of supplies. Uh, they had made, you know, like all of the stuff they thought the soldiers would want. But as soon as the soldiers stopped needing things, what are you going to do? You need to keep making blankets? Nobody wants your blankets. And you keep making guns? Like, we don't even need guns anymore. So we had built this whole economy on going to war and supporting the war. And then when the war ended, it was like, oh, shit. Uh, suddenly none of us need to be doing the jobs that we were doing that also our money means nothing which is going to happen again in the Civil War you'll see um, so what starts happening after the war is this sort of drive to put the economy back to where it had been make America great again right um, so the private interest sector started to really really go up so whereas previously it had been like guilds representing themselves now we we're getting back into the sort of corrupt aspect of it we we're starting to see politicians um, using their political power for personal gain which again nothing new right so they started doing um, this thing called pork barreling which you probably heard of and pork barreling is not nearly as cute as that little pig uh, who looks so happy uh, pork barreling is for whatever reason what it's called when you add like some extra shit to the end of a good law so like they would they would have this very nice law that like everybody liked and they were definitely going to vote into place and then at the end they'd be like also um, my town needs seventy five thousand dollars and everybody's like wait what you know but if you didn't read the whole thing, you wouldn't notice that. And this is still a very common thing. Uh, pork barreling has a long and proud tradition. Um, so this started this like shift. People stopped thinking about like the greater good. They stopped being patriots. They stopped um, hoping to like make a better world and a better country. And they started looking out for the personal good. So even, even the beautiful parts of America only lasted about 15 minutes. Uh, but I, I still think we can get back. Uh, but we started to see the performance of uh, politicians. So this is when we start to see this idea that the politicians are acting on behalf of the people who got them elected, but not necessarily in a good way. Um, so we start to see this sort of like, I am like voting on behalf of special interest groups, but not necessarily on behalf of my constituents. So like I'm voting for the five people that gave me money for my campaign and not for you know the 25,000 people who live in this town. Again, politics. So. Um, some of the politicians, excuse me, some of the politicians were doing this, and some of the politicians were trying to figure out what to do about all the debt, because we had printed all this extra money. Um, there's some more money down here from 1764, um, and this one is in New Hampshire, I think. Okay. So, anyway, so one of the things that the commoners did uh, when they got into office was that they, they didn't necessarily act on behalf of the people you know, who had always been wealthy, they acted on behalf of like everybody. So they started canceling debts, which again, what a modern issue, right? So if you had an existing debt, sometimes they would just forgive it, just like wipe the slate clean so that you could like start from scratch, um, which is something that we're talking about again, especially with student loan debts, like maybe we should just scratch them. We should, uh, fingers crossed. Um, but they also started like reducing your debts, um, they started printing sometimes a little bit more money, which never fixes the problem. So we started to see a lot of changes in the economy. But what this really meant was that the people who had previously been wealthy and had loaned out all this money lost it. So basically, they had been up here with all this money saved, and then they loaned it out with the intention of getting interest. But then those loans got canceled, so that money was just gone. Um, all of the money they loaned out, gone. All of the interest, gone. Um, the people who were supposed to pay them back, gone. So even though I, for instance, would really like to cancel student loan debt, um, it is important to recognize that on the big scale, all of that money would just sort of be wiped out and it would be a huge loss uh, for the lending companies. And in a lot of ways, it would be a huge loss for the government. Um, but I mean, to be fair, like, Crimea River lending company, but still, um, that dramatic loss of money that had previously existed is a difficult, like, hurdle to cross in an economic world. So, basically, the, the rich people were no longer in control of the government, and so weird shit was happening, basically. So, what we ended up with when we, when we made the Continental Congress and when we started in on like uh, the Constitution was that we had these ideals about uh, patriotism and about equality and about, you know, like a really Republican system. Republican meant something different then. Um, but it turned out that Americans don't want to be selfless. Uh, Americans are really profoundly self-interested. It was kind of our jam. So we want equality because we want equality for me. 
um, we are surprised when other people get equality, like every single time. Um, like if you start to hear people talking about like Black Lives Matter and then somebody's like, all lives matter, it's like, no, no. <laughs> when other people get equality, we're very surprised. Uh, so this is kind of that same thing. Like we, we wanted uh, to be equal under the law. We wanted to all have a lot of lands and a lot of wealth. And then when it turned out that that meant um, also other people got land and wealth, we were like, oh, shit, like I, I just meant me, you know? So this is what we ended up sort of putting into place when we set up our government. This was sort of that, that change where we were like, oh, if we want our government to serve us, the like five rich dudes, we need to set it up so it only serves us, the five rich dudes. And they did. Um, so when you hear people talk about the American government not working, like it, oh, it's working. It's working exactly like it was designed to work. It works really, really well. Um, it just doesn't work for the like noble causes that we said we wanted it to work for. So this is sort of where things begin to start to go downhill. Obsessed with equality, now we're suddenly obsessed with self-interest. So here we start to enter into an argument that is going to sound familiar uh, to those of you who are Hamilton super fans, uh, which is this idea of federalism. So this is when we start to discuss whether we should have a really, really big, powerful government or whether we should have a series of state governments um, that are more powerful and then just one sort of like big, nice one. This is an argument we're still having. States' rights is, is still a problem, but in short, this is basically it. So federalism was basically this idea that we got a, a disinterested and dispassionate umpire of a government to settle disputes. Sort of like the Supreme Court or so, like if, if two states are fighting, they have a higher power to go up to, and that would be the federal government. That said, the federal government, in, in the Federalist viewpoint, didn't have a lot of other power. So they could like settle disputes, and they were sort of the overarching umpire, but they weren't necessarily this like all-powerful social welfare being uh, that, that other people argued for. So basically, Federalist wanted a large, but largely disinterested, super neutral government. And these people who, who were Federalists um, were the founding fathers. So this is really what they envisioned. But they were largely wealthy, aristocratic white men. So they essentially thought we could just leave things and they would work themselves out because in their lives, everything had worked out. You know what I mean? Like, so like when you when you come from a position of privilege, sometimes I think you forget that it might not be the same for other people. And so they were like, yeah, but everything's fine. And if we have a fight, like umpire daddy will solve it. So the federalist government was basically like made up of, of educated men, but who they wanted to be the federalist government got complicated. Because, okay, so let's say you do have one, you know, ultimate Supreme Court. Who do you put on that Supreme Court? Where are you going to find a disinterested man with no business interests? Like, where are you going to find somebody who is educated enough to do this job and wealthy enough to do this job, but who isn't entrenched uh, in business? This is one of the reasons that we um, traditionally, again, our current president is not following the rules, but traditionally we require the president to divest himself of his business interests because we don't want him giving financial benefit to things that would directly benefit him. Um, and the reason why we do it has become abundantly clear in the last couple of years. Um, so that was one of the arguments against federalism. was like, okay, but where are you going to find a bunch of guys who want this job but are somehow also neutral? There aren't those. So that was one of the reasons that we, we were afraid that federalism wouldn't work. We were afraid that people couldn't act without self-interest. So the anti-federalists were the ones who said, listen, it's only ever going to be self-interest. It's only ever going to be self-interest all the way. So what we need is a big old government um, that represents the will of the people. So basically, the people will vote in their self-interest, who will tell the representatives to vote in those, their self-interest, who will ultimately vote nationally in their self-interest. So it would just be self-interest all the way up, right? So essentially, instead of saying, why don't we just have some neutral guys who will make excellent decisions on all of our behalves, and they were saying, they're only ever going to be self-interested, so why don't we just elect the ones we like? So the anti-federalists were basically saying like there aren't disinterested gentlemen we don't even know those guys instead we need deeply interested gentlemen uh and we'll just vote on who we like the best to be interested on our behalf i hope this is making sense we'll watch hamilton It'll make sense. Okay. so what ended up happening um was basically this guy, William Finley, um, and I, I love William Finley too. Plus, look at that portrait, gorgeous. William Finley basically, in the, in the Bank of North America Charter, said, listen, we're never going to have a series of disinterested elite gentlemen. Um, let's just scrap that whole idea. Let's just go with anti-federalists. Let's just be a self-interested nation. 
like let's I mean like let's just lean in so he specifically was talking about bank reform and he said that the wealthy elite can vote on bank reform they just have to admit their bias and that was sort of the start of this whole thing so he said basically of course you have bias when it comes to bank reform you can still vote you just have to admit that you have bias so this is why we require so many like financial disclosures especially for people in positions of power uh, and why we again require them to divest themselves of their interests because if you are voting in your own self-interest, you are not neutral. So this was the beginning of that. This is William Finley was like, look, I get you're self-interested. I'm chill with that. You just have to say so out loud. Always the hardest thing, right, for Americans. So we sort of lost our idealism. We sort of, as a nation, uh, admitted that we were just a bunch of self-interested old fat white dudes. Um, and, and it was like a real tipping point. And so we had spent all of this time on idealism and talking about how great it would be if everybody was equal. And then we got there and we were like, oh, never mind. Uh, which is so human, uh, disappointing, but so human. And so instead of the sort of idealized, uh, federalist, neutral, loving everybody government, we ended up with, uh, you know, a self-interested, uh, pluralistic, and divided system. And it is increasingly divided. Like the idea with self-interest was that you can have more than one self-interest, but these days, like division is our jam. Um, if you watch any aspect of the news, you'll see a lot of people talking about division. It makes for good television. Um, the truth, of course, is that most Americans agree on most things, but that makes for a very boring television show. So we focus on like the 10% of people who are really angry. Um, and this is sort of where that started, this idea that we just accepted uh, this level of self-interest and this level of like, darkness kind of like it got a little shady so this is where we start to see interest group politics really take off this is where we start to see lobbyists become like sketchy um this is the end of the beautiful thing that we had designed so that's the downfall uh, this idea that that we had previously imagined a society and a government that would benefit everybody the upside kind of upside um is that if it was all going to be about self-interest americans were like oh well then i'll vote yeah. Like it made it really personal. Like if you thought that a bunch of disinterested people were acting in your best interest in Washington and you didn't have to participate, you wouldn't vote because like, um, you know, just like let them, let them do their thing. But if you thought that a series of increasingly self-interested people uh, were, were doing their thing up in Washington, you would act in your self-interest and vote what you should do. Uh, so basically we decided that everybody has the right to vote. And again, asterisk, uh, we're working on it, but we're not there yet. So that means every person can vote and every person can represent their interests. So in a sense, democracy was still working. This idea that like, if we just admit that we're self-interested and we lean in, we can all participate. So the upside was sort of that the importance of voting was established. Um, and this is again, something that I hope we'll talk about on Thursday, this idea that the right to vote is the right to represent your self-interest. So here comes our uh, last, last little argument here. And this is the power that the government should have. Um, so if it's not going to be a sort of like overarching, nice, calm, friendly little government, uh, we end up with these sort of two arguments. And this is the Republicans and the Federalists. So the Republicans were sort of, um, again, the anti-Federalists. And they said we should have the smallest government possible. It should just be like an umpire that exists to like uh, control the special interest groups when they get out of hand. Like people are fine. People are ethical and they will behave, so why don't we just have a little tiny baby government? Which is a gorgeous idea, but ultimately the Federalists won because the Federalists said, no, people can't be trusted. Uh, the only thing that we can do is to have like a really active government that controls every aspect of their lives. And again, this is an argument we're still having. Small government versus big government, states rights versus federal rights. Like this is one of the things that uh, you better pick a side because I'm gonna divide you on Thursday. Um, do we want, to assume that the people are chill and we only need government for like the most you know egregious things or do we want to assume that the people are idiots and we need the government to tell them what to do all the time like this this is sort of a, one of our epic american battles um and so this is where that battle started and it was very much jefferson versus hamilton so the problem uh, with a self-interested government is that you can use it to make money. And again, this is where Hamilton, poor Hamilton, was like, you guys, we don't want this to happen. Um, if we have a really, really powerful government, people will use it for evil. Uh, people will use it to give money to themselves and to their cronies. They will use it to sort of like, um, you know, hire 
contractors who are technically just them. Um, and again, this is what happened. And so Hamilton was like, no, you guys, we shouldn't let people make money from their position in the government. And everybody else was like, but we want to. So we did. So what ended up happening um, was that we did design a government where the like top, you know, 1% could benefit from that government. Um, but we did also design a government where pretty much anybody could rise up. So we ended up with a sort of medium between the two worlds. Like it's certainly not an aristocracy, but it certainly benefits the people at the top still. Um, one of the things that happened was that the founding fathers looked at it years later and didn't like it. And this is another thing that we don't talk about in American history classes, the extent to which um, the founding fathers were actually not very pleased with what they had created. Um, a lot of them ended up becoming dramatically impoverished, especially because of, um, you know, inheritance laws. A lot of them got like really disillusioned. Um, all of them were drunk to start with anyway. So for a lot of the, the former Federalists and the founding fathers, they were shops like they got really really rich in the uh, revolution itself like during the war but then because of the very government they had set up they lost all their money and they were sad and poor uh and so it's it's on the one hand kind of awful because we revere them and we want them to be like as, as wonderful and powerful as possible on the other hand it's sort of proof that their system worked um like if they accidentally disempowered themselves and, and ended up equal with the other people it worked. So again, uh, in a lot of ways, the system is working exactly like the system is supposed to work. So this is our final thought here. Um, even Hamilton, uh, who, <laughs> bless his little heart, really, really thought the best of Americans, even he um, had to admit that we, we couldn't really establish a nation based on like goodwill towards all, like there's just not that much uh, utopia available to us. But instead, uh, we could establish a nation where at least people could vote in their self-interest. So even if we don't have ultimately this like disinterested, like a deist sort of view, like a, a nice polite series of men making decisions for us, at least we can make decisions for ourselves. So we end up, yes, it's unbalanced, but at least the American people have a say. Uh, so stop voting against your own self-interest. It's the most American thing you can do is to vote on your own behalf uh, and to have the best possible result for you as a human. So this is kind of one of the difficult things that we have to deal with. Like, is the government a beautiful, equal, uh, federalist dream? It is not. Uh, it is a bunch of like terrible, corrupt people who are trying to make money. But you can change that. You can vote them out of office. You can go into office yourself. You can become one of the corrupt people, not really. But you know, the, the beauty of the system is that you can vote in your self-interest and you don't have to like sort of allow this to continue to happen. So that was a lot of information. That was a lot of chapters. And uh, you know, Dr. Wood fits a lot of stuff in one book. Uh, that's his jam. So now that I can see all of your faces, well, two of your faces and some of your chickens once again. Um, does anybody have any, any questions before we disband for the day? All right, well, send me emails if you do. Uh, when we come out tomorrow, there'll be slightly less information. I apologize for the massive information dump, but hopefully it made sense, this idea that like self-interest is our jam and equality is our jam. America. Okay. All right. Well, send me emails if you have any questions. Um, and otherwise, I will see you guys tomorrow. Uh, meet back here at 11 o'clock. Thank you.